Highlander is about a group of immortals who just kind of hang out over thousands of years until the gathering, where those that remain will battle to be the last because, as the epic tagline states, there can be only one immortal that is allowed to be living after the gathering. That, that's word. Is that right? That doesn't sound right. From the dawn of time we came, moving silently down through the centuries. <laughs> Did Sean Connery record this in a bathroom or some Struggling to reach the time of the Oh my god, he did record in a bathroom. When the few who remain um, will battle okay. the last. Then I've got no nothing. Has ever known. We meet up with Connor McLeod in present day New York City, where he's making ends meet as one half of the great wrestling tag team, the fabulous Freebirds, and hold up. Okay, I'm getting word that that is actually Michael Hayes, and he is not playing the role of Connor. Cut. I'm telling you, this shot is going to look fantastic. And they said the helicopter wasn't meant for interior shots. All right, Nathaniel, pull up and let's get out of here. Nathaniel? Oh my god, pull up. Oh my god, we're not going to burn. And it's because of Highlander that movies no longer use helicopters for interior shots, no matter how awesome it may look. Christopher Lambert plays the iconic Connor McCloud, and he makes some very interesting choices with the character. He squints a lot and appears to gaze into the far off distance, almost as if he's looking through you. I imagine he does this to show his amusement with the mortals that he interacts with on a daily basis. And his accent seems to be a mix of different dialects to show that he has assimilated himself into numerous cultures over hundreds of years. You talk funny, Nash. Where are you from? Lots of different places. Uh, actually... Turns out that uh, the accent is because Christopher Lambert was literally just learning how to speak English when this movie was made, and oh my god, the squinting is most likely due to his profound myopia, which renders him almost completely blind without his glasses. You know, it's the 80s, so there are only like eight actors, so I guess beggars can't be choosers. Connor engages in a sword fight in the parking garage with Iman Fazil. Not the fastest way to leave a sword fight, but it is the flashiest. Okay, he's just showing off now. It's like those people that ride their bikes without holding onto the handlebars, and I just secretly wish they would wipe out just that they're in the same place as me, confidence-wise. Connor cuts off his head and consumes Fazil's... essence? And oh my god, run dude, the security guards are coming! And Connor tries valiantly to make a getaway before he's promptly arrested by... all the cops. And we're slowly given Connor's backstory through a number of flashbacks. Keep him in one piece, do you hear? Aye, we all know what piece that is! <laughs> My left thumb. Connor was a Highlander when his clan rides into battle against the Kurgan. Remember our agreement, Murdoch. The boy is mine. It we'll bring it on, Kurgan, because just then Connor storms into battle. McCloud! Okay. Connor kind of moseys into battle, but you know, lack of urgency is also pretty badass. Oh sweet Jesus. With how quickly things happen in battle and the urgency required to kill the enemy in front of you and then move on to the next, this, this seems kind of personal. Angus died bravely in battle. He was run down with a battle axe. How did Brother Hamish fare? Aye, he drowned in a puddle. Oh dear, aye, aye, aye. Connor and Kurgan meet on the battlefield, and Kurgan kills Connor, like, pretty easily. The police, including forensics expert Brenda Wyatt, begin their meticulous and thorough search for clues surrounding the murder of Fazil. Luckily for the story, Brenda is also an expert in the metallurgical history of ancient sword making. <laughs> Everyone needs a hobby, I guess. Lieutenant Frank Moran runs a tight crime scene. No more than 50 people allowed to traipse through and absolutely no moving of evidence. Frank, come here. Oh, careful, Lieutenant. Remember, there's a body there. I'll just move it back. No worries. What the hell have you got? A Toledo Salamanca. A what? A Tuco Salamanca. Pay attention, man.
Oh, tight, 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 yeah! Connor is now going by the name Russell Nash, and the police are interrogating him about the murder. First rule of interrogations, get the perp to start talking and just let him give you all the information you need. Ever see this guy before, Nash? You went down that garage to buy this sword from that guy. What's his name? I don't know. You tell me. Okay, his name is Amon Fazil. Okay, telling him the information. It's also pretty slick. What's that? A sword? Lido Salamanca broadsword, worth about a million bucks. Okay, it's getting a little difficult to discern who is interrogating whom here, but... Hey, hey! Am I under arrest? Not yet. Then we're through. And then letting the perp leave after getting into a fight with your deputy. Moran, you've got him right where you want him. Garage and water from the sprinkler. It also left a man's decapitated body. I, uh, I think you got the importance of those events switched around. Trench coat, dad jeans, and white tennis shoes. You're an immortal, Connor. Dress like it. A power suit or something. Choreography for this fight scene alone took three months to get right. Where are they right now? Is this some kind of steam warehouse? Put your hands on your head. Another time, Highlander. I called you Highlander. What did I mean? There can only be one. Only one what? Listen, no. Shut up! Don't you ever follow me again. You only have one life. You value it. A normal police officer would take all of those as personal threats against them. Back in the 1500s, everyone is really weirded out that Connor didn't die. The script never actually called for Connor to be immortal, but Christopher Lambert had such a hard time pretending to be dead that the filmmakers just had to keep him alive somehow. You saw the Windangers. He should have died. I see he's got the devil in him. When someone starts talking about politics at Thanksgiving, am I right? He's your cousin, man! No cousin of mine would vote libertarian. It's always rough when your wife calls for you to be burned alive just because you got better. There'll be no burning here today! Finally, someone with some sense about them. We'll banish him! Connor then starts a new life with his lady Heather, and they are met by Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez, played by legendary Spanish actor, uh, Sean Connery. I guess he's some sort of Scottish Spaniard. Rare, but plausible. expensive sword, you guys. Oh, man. Between the helicopter crash and now that sword, we are ridiculously over budget. Oh, my God. What is that noise? Oh, my God. Nathaniel, pull up. Oh, my God. Not again. Ramirez explains that they belong to a group of immortals who can only be killed by decapitation. And when one immortal decapitates another, the winner receives a transfer of power from the deceased called the Quickening. When only a few of us are left, we will feel an irresistible pull towards a faraway land. To fight for the prize. Ramirez tells Connor that the Kurgan, the strongest of all the immortals, must not win the prize or mankind will enter an eternal dark age because Kurgan is a dick. Tonight you sleep in hell. There can be only one! Like, just a raging asshole. Will you do something for me, Connor? In the years to come? Will you light a candle and remember me on my birthday? Want me to light a candle? Every year? For my whole life? Yeah. Give me a chore, why don't you? Jeez. You know, the average life expectancy back then was about 35, so she really did pretty good. So maybe some of that Highlander life expectancy is sexually transmitted. Huh? So Connor then meets up with fellow immortal Sunda Castagir, and they talk about the impending gathering. See, Castagir has more of the right idea about how an immortal should dress. Just pick the era that had the most comfortable clothing and just run with it. But then Krugan catches up with Castagir and decapitates him. 
You know, in situations like this, Connor should be glad to have a psycho like Kurgan around to dispatch all of these other immortals. Yeah, it sucks that your friends are dead, but you were going to be forced to murder them soon anyway, so it just avoids some major awkwardness. It's like when your friend wants you to listen to his rap demo, and you're like, man, I don't want to hurt his feelings. And then he gets eaten by a bear, and you're sad, but also kind of relieved at the same time. So Kurgan and Connor are the only two immortals remaining. Oh, Jesus. This goes to show that no matter how long you've been alive, cutting your own hair is never a good idea. Happy Halloween, ladies. No sense of humor. Uh, maybe it's because you forgot the punchline. And the setup. And your delivery sucked. Brenda finds out that Nash has been inheriting the same house and fortune for over 200 years. And after she confronts Connor, he demonstrates his immortality by having her stab him. And Brenda then discovers that she has a very specific fetish. Kurgan finds out about Connor's relationship with Brenda and kidnaps her to draw Connor into a final battle. And after a long and admittedly badass battle, Connor defeats and beheads the Kurgan. So Connor is the only immortal and I guarantee that future installments will not just throw this to the side and pretend like it never happened because that would just cheapen the experience and surely they would never ever do that.